Hello, this is Father Hightower, and welcome to Vox SFX, the voice of St. Francis Xavier Parish in Missoula, Montana, and sponsored in part by the Foundation for the Diocese of Helena. We are so pleased that you have joined us. Your participation enriches our community. We hope that our show serves as a point of light, helping to deepen our understanding and experience of the Catholic faith and history. Join us as we seek through prayer, study, interviews, and discussion the roots of our ancient mysteries. Welcome to Vox SFX, the voice of St. Francis Xavier in Missoula. We're very pleased that you could join us for this episode. Today we're going to be talking about the Feast of Pentecost, one of our ecstatic holidays throughout the year. If, if Lent and Advent are about reflection and penance, then Pentecost is a party. It is the foundation of our church. It is the beginning of our faith. It is pretty darn important for us uh, in, as Catholics, as Christians, all over the world. And I think that this particular year we got a, a really nice treat. I ended up recording this intro just kind of the night before, and this is Saturday the 11th, right before it comes out. But the reason I wanted to record this is because if any of you in the northern half of the United States have looked outside, either last night or tonight, you will notice God's true grandeur shining down upon us. You can look up and see the majesty of creation. You know, it may be simply explained as an electromagnetic storm hitting our magnetosphere, igniting it into a cascade of colors, but but we have been given the faculties to understand beauty, to understand what it is to, to recognize the sheer immensity and power of nature around us and the way it can be displayed so gorgeously sometimes. So if, if you weren't able to get out and take a look at the sky, hopefully you're able to see it next time. You're able to see the pictures that came out from this one because I can't think of a of a better way to celebrate Pentecost than literal tongues of fire descending upon the earth. How cool is that? <laughs> oh, but I'm really excited to get to this episode with y'all. Uh, we got Father Cochran on, and he provides some outstanding insight into this wonderful topic. Uh, before we get into it, though, I just had a couple of announcements from here locally. Uh, St. Francis Xavier is offering a Memorial Day Mass on uh, Memorial Day, the 27th, at noon followed by a barbecue grill by the Knights of Columbus. It is a potluck, so you are encouraged to bring whatever you might like to bring and engage with our, our, the faith community. The Knights of Columbus, a great group of guys, by the way, and they put on a heck of a, a meal, whether it's the fish fry, the fish fry, try saying that 10 times fast, or the barbecues that they put on uh, frequently. Yeah, come check us out. They're pretty darn good. Uh, and our vacation Bible school is from June 10th to the 14th, and it's going to be from 8.30 in the morning till noon on those days. Registration for campers and volunteers is now open. If you're wanting to send your child to this, it is 75 bucks per child, but is an additional 25 bucks per sibling. So the larger your family, the bigger discount, but we're Catholics, that's not a huge problem. <laughs> uh, but this program is intended for those th uh, from kindergarten till about fifth grade. Uh, St. Joseph's School is looking for a principal, a preschool teacher, a PE teacher for pre-K through 8th grade, and a learning resource teacher aide. These job postings can be found at missoulacatholicschools.org backslash mcs dash employment. If you've got the necessary skills and the desire, uh, check it out. Uh, St. Saint, Saint Joseph is a great way to enter into the schools here in, in Missoula. And lastly, I wanted to do a plug for the SEAL program here at St. Francis Xavier. We just finished up our program for the year. It goes from September until May, or thereabouts. Some people continue on working with their directors past May. It depends on kind of where you're at in the process. There's, we don't want to rush anybody. We don't want to push people along. It's, the process is our process. But registration is already open for this next year. And as somebody who has personally gone through these exercises, I, I cannot recommend them highly enough. They have taught me a different way of prayer. They have taught me a more reflective way of looking at the Gospels, of looking at Scripture. It really helped me enter deeper into my faith. So if you are listening to this and you're in Missoula, Montana, 
and or, or the surrounding area for that matter and can make it in for a once a month meeting uh, in person because you know you can do the it, there's a lot of a lot of cool stuff with zoom now the pandemic really made us all very comfortable using various video chat software so there's no there's no requirement that you have to meet with your director face to face in fact we've even got people who are out of state so if you are interested just Get in touch with us here. It's right there on the main page for St. Francis Xavier, where you can go to register for it. Free, free of charge. We're the only parish that, that we know of that does this completely parish-sponsored. So if you're a part of our community here in, in Missoula, you really would benefit from doing this. So uh, just head to St. Francis Xavier or sfxmissoula.org, and it should be right there on the page. You'll see it right, uh, a registration for the spiritual exercises for everyday living. And like I said, I cannot recommend them enough. Um, they were hugely instrumental to me. But speaking of things that inspire us, let's talk about the descent of the Holy Spirit and the celebration thereof here on Pentecost. <laughs> With us in the studio today is Father Cochran to talk to us about this wonderful concept of, of Pentecost. Father, welcome to the studio again. Thank you, Nicholas. It's good to be here. Now, Pentecost is one of those holidays that most folks who are not Christian don't necessarily know about. It. You know, when you look at like Easter and Christmas, even people who aren't you know, practitioners of our faith still often celebrate those holidays. But Pentecost is one of the uniquely Christian holidays that takes place that is really focused on, on us. What is Pentecost? From the Greek, it's 50, 50 days after Easter. What it is, in a sense, is the birthday of the Christian church. Because from the scriptures, the risen Lord is with, teaching, accompanying the apostles, the disciples. And yet, for the word the ministry of the church to go forward, he has to depart so that these men and women can then be empowered to do their job. So there's this time period that the descent of the Holy Spirit kind of completes the work enabling them to go out into the world. So this descent of the Holy Spirit, what exactly does that mean? What, what is significant about this, this coming forth? In John's Gospel, uh, on the first day of the week, on the Easter day, Jesus approaches the disciples, the apostles, in the up, upper room and breathes on them and says, Receive the Holy Spirit. And then it's often put in the uh, form of forgiveness of sins, but it's from Acts that we kind of see the, the greater thing where the descent of the Holy Spirit is kind of like this unique gift to empower these men and women to get out of that upper locked room and get into the world. So in, in a sense, Jesus is like this teacher and he is empowering his students, as it were, to then go and do what they've been told. Mainly it's about a personal relationship. It's not about they have a certain catechism, they've memorized it, and then they're going to go tell other people about it. It's rather, it's a personal relationship with the risen Lord and that these men and women also had that personal relationship with the earthly Jesus. So they've encountered both. It's a unique, tr life-transforming uh, experience such that they have these gifts that they had not realized before, both a humility and a courage, a wisdom, and also an ability to bring that wisdom of God to people in other cultures and other languages, people who are not educated. So the Holy Spirit is that empowerment of God that whether you want to call it a sanctifying power or an enabling power, to make us break out of our bubble, if we want to use that metaphor. 
No, I, I do like that. Now, when you're when you're talking about these gifts of the Holy Spirit in the Gospels, they're they're mentioned a couple of times and in different ways. You know, on one hand, the Holy Spirit, the the gifts of the Holy Spirit come with the the gift of prophecy, you know, speaking in tongues and and such. But then you also have Paul, who mentions uh, it, when he's talking about the gifts of the Holy Spirit, joy, love, peace, patience, kindness, generosity, gentleness, faithfulness, modesty, and self control. There's nothing on that list about prophecy and speaking in tongues. That is correct. The gifts of the Holy Spirit are perhaps our more modern. Catholic faith has tried to kind of compartmentalize them into the seven gifts of the Holy Spirit, which are kind of like a an umbrella term. And then there is the other expressions of the Holy Spirit that are built upon these gifts, wisdom, uh, perseverance, self-control, modesty, and so forth. It's kind of, that's one of the catechetical things that I can remember a bishop when he was doing confirmation at a parish one time was asking the young men and women, do you know the seven gifts of the Holy Spirit? And he was able to rattle them off very quickly. But I think the gifts of the Holy Spirit are something that humans desire, that they train for in different cultures, in different times. So wisdom, of course, is something that is desired in every culture, an ability to persevere in time in challenging times, to have self-control, to know modesty, to be around people in a most appropriate way. But then the Apostle Paul is kind of expounding because he wants people to not just kind of have these academic gifts or these very tried and true gifts that separate adults from others, but he wants them to be just alive as he found himself alive. And that speaking in tongues, he also mentions about when someone speaks in tongues, there needs to be somebody who interprets the tongues, that it not just be gibberish, but that it be a known language of a known people. And that then there would be somebody there that says, hey, I understand that. And wow, God is alive. God has found me through this disciple and has pulled me into a relationship with this risen Lord. So that's kind of what the Apostle Paul, he he doesn't want people just to kind of have the check marks and say, okay, I've got wisdom, I've got humility, I've got this. (laughs) What he wants them, he wants them to have those, but he, he wants them to be joyful people because a very dour person is not going to really attract more people to this movement, this Jesus movement, the risen Lord movement. And so it, it's not just a matter of having this transformation within the self. It is having that transformation within the self affect those around you. Yes, yes. Relationships do that. Think of with the joy that you have being connected, united with a spouse, affects everything you do. Uh, The way you interact with people on the street, the people in the office building, the people on the telephone. They they can sense there's a certain joy in this person who has a very significant relationship with another. Which is a beautiful thing, and it's mm-hmm. it's uh, it's wonderful that we are empowered mm-hmm. uh, to do that. So when we're when we're thinking about Pentecost, you had mentioned that it means fifty days, mm-hmm. and it's another one of those holidays, much like Easter, where it's never on the same day every single year. It kind yes. of moves around. Yes, the celebration of Pentecost depends upon the date of Easter, and the date of Easter for Catholic Christians, the first Sunday after the first full moon after the spring equinox. Now, in the Orthodox tradition, they will not celebrate Easter until the Jewish Passover has been celebrated. And that was just celebrated just last week. Mm -hmm. One of the chief rabbis in Jerusalem, in Israel, they added a leap month to their calendars. The calendars, the lunar and the solar calendar were getting off uh, quite a bit. 
And so they added a leap month. Wow. And so that's how the uh, Orthodox just celebrated Easter because they again wait for the celebration of the Jewish Passover before they will actually mark the date for the Christian celebration of Easter in their tradition. Now, just to clarify so that there's uh, no confusion amongst the listeners, this is being recorded at the end of April. So just in case you're sitting there being like, wait a second, Easter was last week. I, no, that was like a month ago. So, uh, but yeah, we're, we're recording it when we are. Yes. So that means that it doesn't match up. Like our, our dating system between the Orthodox Church and the Latin Church, some years they're going to be significantly off at that point. That is correct. So this year, the Orthodox celebration of Easter just occurred. Uh, next year, in 2025, we're actually going to be on the same day, which I believe is going to be June 8th. I looked it up a while ago, but Easter next year is one of the latest dates possible. And so uh, everything, the stars are in alignment. Uh, again, it, it's the, the challenge of a lunar calendar versus a solar calendar the Julian calendar and the Gregorian calendar, which we most of the Western world is using. Uh, most countries are using that because everybody's on the same date, just different time zones. Sure. Mm -hmm. Makes it easier to do business that way. That is correct, <laughs> especially in a world that has 24-hour business. Indeed. Mm -hmm. And while we're talking about the Orthodox Church, like, you know, Pentecost is a big deal for us. You know, it's, mm -hmm. it'll be coming up here. Everybody's going to be wearing their, their red. red. Mm -hmm. uh, but as, as much as we like it, the Orthodox, it is like really important. It is a very key concept in their celebration of their faith tradition, that the coming of the Holy Spirit and the whole emphasis on the power of the Holy Spirit working in the sacraments. So in the divine liturgy, uh, which we as Catholics might say, oh, that's their, their version of Mass, they actually call it the divine liturgy, so much is paid attention to the ruha, the breath, the spirit that is then transforming the gifts of bread and wine. Uh, so they have a very deep appreciation and explanation of how the gifts of water, bread and wine, celebrating matrimony and so forth is the power of the Holy Spirit, the gift that Jesus, the risen Lord, has given. And so they date uh, their Sundays in their liturgical calendar after Pentecost. So second Sunday after Pentecost, sixth Sunday after Pentecost, and so forth until it comes back to what they call the Great Lent, which is their understanding, their appreciation and practice of Lent. And when we, we look at the way that they celebrate uh, Pentecost and their color choices and their kind of uh, just overall ambiance, it seems to bear a lot more res uh, resemblance to the old uh, Jewish holiday of, uh, correct me if I'm not saying this right, Shavuot? Shavuot? I do not have an exact uh, translation or <laughs> pronunciation of that, but it's a festival of Thanksgiving. Usually it's festival uh, right after Passover, and it goes back to the agrarian gifts Thanksgiving gifts that are brought to the temple. Over the centuries, it was transformed from an agrarian gift of Thanksgiving to the gift of the Torah, where it was uh, more, I don't want to say intellectualized, but it became more of the gift of the Word of God rather than the, the produce of the land which God had given to the people. And the similarities there when we're talking about how Genesis and Exodus really weave themselves, uh, you know, prophecy-wise and mm -hmm. content-wise into the New Testament, mm -hmm. it, it looks like a big portion of it, too, is kind of the reestablishment or the remembrance of the, no the Noahic uh, covenant mm -hmm. when, when God said to Noah, I'm not going to destroy the world for, again. Yes. So you have that for, for that re uh, festival, and then for Pentecost, Again, God saying and making the new covenant of saying, hey, I've, I've sent my son, my spirit into the world. 
uh, the correlation there is pretty cool. It is. The Noahic covenant symbolized by the rainbow is the promise that God is not going to send another ravaging flood. Again, this is something that the Gilgamesh epic that perhaps the Genesis account relied upon. But anyway, God is saying what was created at first has been renewed through this flood. Pentecost for the Christian faithful is this gift of God that is renewing the world in his son, the risen Lord. And so uh, the early Christian church, they again, many of them were Jewish Christians. They were trying to, to walk both covenants. And it became practically impossible that for them to do both. So some remained with the Jewish covenant, while many others that went to the Christian covenant but they still had the memory of the celebration, the Shabbat, of giving thanks for what God has given. And so the gift of the Holy Spirit is what God has given. And so there is kind of a, a certain time period. The, the 50 days also follow the, the 50 days following Passover. Uh, so the, the Christian, Jewish Christian people would have known this and they would have maybe, I don't know if I want to say piggybacked, but they incorporated this gift from the Jewish ancestors into this new covenant established in the risen Lord. And, you know, that, again, that covenant is, is important and that's kind of the whole foundation of our, of our faith. Mm -hmm. when, we, when we look at the liturgical differences between ourselves and the Orthodox, again, for one thing, there's just the sheer emphasis that is placed upon it. For you know, we got the Triduum when it comes to Easter, but they also have a several day celebration when it comes to the celebration of. Uh, Pentecost. They do have a, a three day celebration of Pentecost, the Pentecost Sunday, the Monday, and the Tuesday, and again, it's kind of giving great thanks, taking more time. To, to give thanks, to have rituals, to have uh, special prayers, which enliven the people, refocus upon the faith that they have uh, inherited, that they live, and that they will pass on to the next generation. And the color difference also intrigues me. The difference between, as we had said in the, in the, you know, the Western church, we use red, it's the mm -hmm. symbol of Pentecost, but they use green uh, for theirs. Why the difference? We use red because we go back to the Acts chapter 2, the tongues of fire. So normally you, you think of fire having a reddish hue. It does have an, with other chemicals. It can be a different color. The Orthodox Church uses green because they're making that connection with their Jewish ancestors about the agrarian uh, giving thanks. So what is growing from the earth? So the green would be definitely associated with nature, and nature is a gift from God. And so that is one explanation uh, for having uh, those liturgical colors. We use green as kind of a, and this, we could go a number of uh, ideas about in our Catholic uh, church about the green, but uh, it's associated with the, regular day-to-day -day life, uh, the green vestments. And, and of course, it's part of nature. And we call it ordinary time. Ordinary or counted time. Counted. So from the Latin ordinaris, uh, you know, first, second, third, fourth. So each Sunday following Pentecost, once we've gotten out of the following Pentecost, we have Corpus Christi Sunday, Trinity Sunday, and then we go back to the seventh Sunday in ordinary time, eighth Sunday in ordinary time. And it's just a way of keeping track of the weeks uh, liturgically. When we look at Christmas and Easter, both of them were named as holidays later on mm -hmm. uh, during the councils or by the traditions of the early Christians. Pentecost has kind of been there since the beginning, though. It has. Again, although... The, any written descriptions of it don't appear until 
uh, the first or second century after uh, the resurrection. But yet there's this sense that there had to be something growing organically, no pun intended, among the people about uniting the Jewish uh, celebration of Shabbat uh, with the Christian uh, celebration of the Pentecost, of the gifts of the Holy Spirit. But it did take a little bit of time. Again, anything that has kind of a newness to it is going to take some time to understand, to incorporate, to associate with something that from the past, and then to ritualize it. And so these acts that we think of, you know, Eucharist, Pentecost, uh, Easter, Christmas, these things kind of bubbled up from the faith of people, of their relationship to the risen Lord, to uh, the early apostles and disciples that walked with the earthly Jesus or had encountered the risen Lord. They want to have times of celebration. They want to say, okay, the reason we believe this, that we believe that God sent his son into the world to fully human, well, let's have a birthday for uh, Jesus. And then the uh, Easter celebration, again, is, you know, a movable feast. And then they're saying, okay, Jesus promised to be with his disciples, but not to be walking with them every day. Rather, he's going to put the gift of the Spirit upon them so that they will go out to the world and baptize and proclaim the good news. So the Spirit, the Spirit is, when we talk about the Trinity, the Spirit tends to be one of the more mysterious aspects it is. of the Trinity. Mm -hmm. When we say that the Spirit descended uh, on that very first Pentecost, is that to say that it wasn't present in the world before then? No, you go back to the book of Genesis, where in the creation story, where the, the Spirit hovers over the water, the breath, the ruha of God is there. It's saying that Jesus has prepared, he's educated, trained these men and women, but now he needs to be back in order for them to do this building the kingdom, he needs to kind of push them out the door. You know, the mama bird pushing the baby bird out of the nest to start to fly. Mm -hmm. And to give them the encouragement to do this and to do things in his name, there needs to be a gift. In the Eucharistic prayer number two, we talk about the dew fall. Well, dew does not fall do condenses. Sure. The same thing with the Spirit. Jesus is empowering them with kind of a gift of himself, similar to the Eucharist, that he's empowering them to really be able to lay hands on people, to bring healing, to baptize, to sanctify, to console, and so forth. And so the gift of the Spirit is kind of like the uh, finishing school in a certain way. Uh, we used to send young men and women, especially young women, to finishing school where they would learn proper manners and etiquette. And then they would be ready, as it were, to take their uh, respective place in society. And the same thing is with the, the gift of the Spirit, is that we need to be trained and educated in what our Christian faith calls us to do, not just being good prayers, but also good doers, and going into not leaving our world, but inserting ourselves into the world, and knowing that there'll be challenges. So if we're going to act in the name of the risen Lord, we're going to need some kind of assurance, ritual insur assurance, that he has blessed us and that we're acting in his name. And so that's, that's the gift of the Spirit to be in a certain way in persona Christi, to, to be Christ's presence to others. 
it seems like another gift of the spirit. You know, it, it talks about about faith, but it it seems to be a way in engaging with relationship with God that is less intellectual and more felt. Mm-hmm. Because Christ, when he came, taught us a lot about thinking. A lot mm-hmm. of his lessons kind of rework our mind, rework the way we look at the world, and and to try to align our morals, our ethics, with what God wants for us. But that's all very intellectual. That's you know listening mm-hmm. to the word and trying to try to process it. You know, into you know logically. The spirit defies logic. That is right. And the spirit fills us with this with this vigor that can't really be described. And it's a vigor that gets us out of the chair and into the world. And it's also a certain boundary uh, that we don't go off into kind of some uh, craziness. <laughs> Saint Ignatius Loyola when he would be working with a directee, he always wanted to know what was being felt interiorly. So like when he would give a scripture passage for someone to pray over or a story about Jesus that was very popular, he wanted to know from that person, what did you feel? How did you feel? Were you sad? Were you angry? Were you happy? And then he would then use kind of his gift of the discernment of spirits to say, okay, which spirit, is it the spirit of light or the spirit of darkness that is moving you? If it's the spirit of light, hang in there with it. So the, the gift of the spirit is there to get us out of our seats, to get us into our world, knowing that sometimes the world's not going to want to hear it, or to be kind to us, but not to be going into the world with a blunt object saying you must believe this way or else. The gift of the Spirit is persuasive and empowering and energetic and attractive. But if it starts to lose some of those qualities and goes to kind of a dark side, then you know that the Spirit of Light is probably not at work. So, Father... We, we we talk about the spirit and about this this personal experience mm-hmm. here. Would you care to share your own experience with the spirit, how you've felt it and felt it guiding you? There's times when I encounter somebody, whether it's on the street or in the church, and I think, okay, what's what's happening? And I'm usually surprised. Uh, I often think they're going to ask me for money. They want a, an hour of my time so that they can tell me all their woes and that's not where I want to be and usually the spirit surprises the dickens out of me that when I uh, when I meet this person and I find out I listen to some of their story and then I start to resonate within myself I, I know what that means you know I know both the joys and the sorrows the loneliness and the being in, incorporated or starting a new project. Uh, and I just think this has almost no chance of success. And then it turns out to be one of uh, the best projects that I had gotten involved in. Mm-hmm. And so I look back at it. The Spirit's kind of that uh, mysterious gift that uh, lets you go beyond our human limits, our human fears, and shows us that there's actually something good going on uh, in other people and other activities. And even if it wasn't quite what you had expected, it wasn't as bad as you thought it might end up becoming. I'm reading this book right now on early Christian mysticism. Okay. And the emphasis that they place on this interaction with the spirit, on this this emotional interaction. You were mentioning St. Ignatius of Loyola earlier in the, the spiritual exercises. Well, that, that idea of feeling was one of the things I struggled with the most. I had no problem intellectualizing the Gospels, mm-hmm. no problem analyzing them from a cultural or intellectual standpoint. But then my director would say, how do you feel about it? And they'd take me aback. I'd be like, feel? I didn't realize I was supposed to really be looking at that because, of course, you feel something. But unless you're thinking about it and really listening to it, you know, the Spirit isn't super loud. The Spirit doesn't hit us like a thunderclap. Most of the time. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> but, it's, but it's in those quiet moments. It's in that ability to kind of clear aside 
the clutter of our mind and let the Spirit speak to us. Yes. When you were mentioning that, uh, it reminded me of one of the Star Trek uh, episodes, the more modern movie, where Mr. Spock is brought back to life and uh, he's going through these uh, very intellectual tests uh, on a computer. And then the very last question is, how do you feel today? And it stops him cold because, uh, and it was, a, it was incredible in, insight where somebody who's living in two different ethnicities or modes of living, uh, you know, the Vulcan, very intellectual, and the human that has a lot of emotion. It was, so it was his mother who was the human and she had purposely put that question in there to make him remember who he is. Hmm. And I think that that's a, that's a key thing is that we are a mixture of the intellectual and the emotional. Uh, when one overrides the other to an enormous extent, if we're all intellectual, we're losing the gift of empathy and compassion. If we operate from pure emotion, we're going to go from sadness to anger to whatever is right on the edge of our uh, life. And usually we're going to end up regretting the actions that we do from kind of a pure emotional standpoint. But yet there are times where we need to be purely intellectual. To You, you want the surgeon in the operating room to be using his or her gifts intellectually. And then when we find, when our, our best friend from 20 years ago rings the doorbell, it's going to be pure emotion. And so it's finding that balance uh, between the intellect and the emotive, the, the, the head and the heart, and how they work together. They inform each other because uh, your intellectual passions are often going to be part of your emotional life. And your emotional life needs some guard, some bordering uh, from the intellectual side. This, this gift of the Spirit, which is so foundational to us interacting with God, I've met a lot of people who, they, they may again believe in God and in Jesus, they may be participating, but that feeling of the spirit, that feeling of the presence of God within oneself is sometimes lacking for folks. What would you advise for somebody who is, is kind of feeling that way to help them tap in to this aspect of God more? Partly, it could be our 20th, 21st century kind of, if not fear, but um, resistance to a faith traditions that uh, in the even beginning of the 19th century into the 20th, 21st century, there's this fear about religion, that it's too emotive, that it doesn't have kind of a scientific rigor. And I think a lot of times it, it is a scary thing to let your heart lead the way, to let uh, where the spirit might be moving you to meet that person, that homeless person on the street and engage them in a conversation or to help somebody on the side of the road. You kind of wonder, am I safe and, and so forth. And it, it's kind of that stepping out of that. Uh, it's not giving up good boundaries of safety, but it's also saying our faith tells us that our lives are in the hand of God. And even when bad things happen, we are still in the hand of God. And it's giving us the courage to go out of our comfort zone. But that's, it's, you know, um, the evangelical churches, they work a lot with expressions of emotion, tears and laughter and singing loud and uh, raising their hand to catch the spirit, as it were. And quite often then they, they go home uh, kind of feeling that both energized as well as a little depleted mm -hmm. you know, of, of, of physical energy. But it's often 
when they're in touch with the gift of the Spirit that Jesus has given us, it's an empowering thing to go beyond our circle, our comfort zone, to read a new book, to meet a new person. For somebody who has found that their job is so deadly dull, to look at what could be, to uh, plant new flowers in the yard instead of letting it all be green grass. Those are little things. And for some people, it's getting the courage to go and become a a missionary, a volunteer. Um, One of my many first cousins uh, had a very successful law career, and she had felt that she had not done enough. And in her 40s, she became a a volunteer, AmeriCorps uh, volunteer, went off to a country which (laughs) was almost in the midst of a civil war, and then they they brought her back home, and she said, I'm not finished yet. And she went off to Romania shortly after the fall of the uh, the wall in Germany, and her job was to help people volunteer in that those decades under the dictator Ceausescu, people were fearful of each other. They were always fearful that someone was going to turn them into the authorities, and so this very slow process of meeting people and saying, you can, you you know, many of them did have an Orthodox, Romanian Orthodox Church relationship and just trying to help them tap into that. And then, you know, she did her two or three years as a, a volunteer and came back to finish her law career. So there's people like that who kind of get that that gift of the spirit that says, I need to do more. I want to do more. And that because she was single, she didn't have a family to uh, be taken care of, that she had that ability and her family said, go, go, go. And so she took that as kind of a sign that, yes, she was supposed to do this. So different people are going to find the gift of the spirit when they let it start bubbling you know, instead of it being on a low simmer, start to do a little bubbling, that they might say, I want to go back to school. I want to learn how to paint. I've always wanted to write my autobiography. I've always wanted to meet the neighbor across the street. He's always got his drapes closed. Little things, those are kind of like the baby steps, as it were, of the gift of the Spirit. And some others are going to say, we're going to pick up and go to another country in following a, a, a faith tradition or a, an idealism. Yeah. So when it comes to, to practice, to when it comes to ob- observation, the gifts of the Spirit don't con- con- confine themselves very easily to a small list. It sounds like it can manifest in a lot of different ways. Many different ways. The gifts of the Spirit are always about not me, but us about the building of the kingdom. So again and again, you go to the Gospels. When Jesus is talking, he's the the kingdom of God is like. The kingdom of heaven is like. And so it's about kind of that one discernment. Is it about me or is it about us? And that relationship with God that is out there. That's beautiful. Well, it looks like we're about done for the day, Father, but uh, did you have anything else you wanted to add about Pentecost or the Spirit before we finish? We can kind of say trust the Spirit, but I I think that's an important thing is that we can become very safety-oriented, you know, stay in our little, little bubbles. I think the gifts of the Spirit as exercised in some of the other Christian churches and even uh, non-Christian churches where people are living lives that are holy, that they are looking out for others, looking out for our common earth, as Pope Francis would say. So the gift of the Spirit is to become a a disciple, and not a disciple to yourself, but a disciple to the world, whether the world is your family, your neighborhood, or across the ocean.
Come, Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of your faithful and kindle in them the fire of your love. Send forth your Spirit, and they shall be created, and you shall renew the face of the earth. Amen. Mm -hmm. Thank you for being with us today as we walk as pilgrims this road together. If you feel called to learn more, please consider checking out St. Francis Xavier or your local Catholic church. All are welcome into our community as God loves us all equally. If you are interested in supporting the Vox SFX podcast, please visit sfxmissoula.org backslash donate. Until next time, go forth in peace and be the light of Christ in someone's day.